Now we're going to talk to Michael Cranish. He is the national political reporter for the Boston Globe, and he has written about the health care mandates that's in the Obama proposal for health care reform. Michael, welcome to the Young Turks. Thanks for having me. All right. Uh, I understand some people are making the argument that um, these mandates are unconstitutional. What is the basis for that argument? Well, in the federal health care plan, there is a proposal under the Obama plan, the Democratic plan, to require most Americans to get health care insurance. There are a number of people, mainly Republicans, who have argued that that is unconstitutional, that the federal government can't require people to basically purchase something. There are others who say it clearly is constitutional under the Commerce Clause, other sections that would let the federal government tell people what to do. Um, so that's the basic argument, and you'll have people on both sides of it. So, you know, I went to law school, and we've uh, learned that the Commerce Clause uh, – overrules just about anything else, <laughs> and that uh, the federal government can do almost anything uh, under the Commerce Clause. Uh, is there a limit to that, or is that, uh, is that really the end of the conversation, well, if, legally if, speaking? If, here's, the, here's the issue. Let me frame the issue for the listeners, and that is, is that I wrote a story based out of Richmond, Virginia, which is about an effort in Virginia to basically say to Virginians, you do not have to have health insurance. No one can require you uh, to get health insurance. And that's basically seen as aimed at the Obama proposal to require what's called the individual mandate that everyone has health insurance. The reason this is so important is that if 30 million more people are required to have insurance, the insurance companies in theory would be able to insure a lot more people because a lot of those people who are uninsured might be relatively young, healthy people, uh, maybe like your listeners, and they would have to get insurance. They would be cheaper to insure, and then they could afford to insure other people who are very expensive to insure. So you get everyone in the pool. What happens now is sometimes people, when they get sick, very sick, they all of a sudden try to get insurance, and it distorts the uh, the whole insurance business in that way. And this has been a big fight. So the, basically, the the whole thread of the Obama plan rests on requiring everyone to have insurance, almost everyone to have insurance. There are some exceptions. People who couldn't afford it would be given subsidies. So in Virginia, they're saying this is an infringement on their rights. Now, the Commerce Clause, it just depends on whether this does, in fact, fall under the Commerce Clause. If everyone agrees that it does, then de facto it would be constitutional, presumably, but there's the question of whether it really does. So there is quite a debate over this. So if Virginia were to pass that law saying it does not fall under the Commerce Clause and it, uh, it is unconstitutional, well, then obviously that would get kicked up to the court system, right? Right. The Supreme Court typically would decide this kind of case, and it's very hard to predict what they might decide. Because uh, there's a huge precedent in favor of the Commerce Clause, and um, generally speaking, the right wing is in favor of uh, corporate America getting <laughs> more customers, etc. But on the other hand, here the Republicans are against it because of political uh, reasoning, and uh, I'm here being a little cynical about how the Supreme Court is going to rule because I don't think that they follow ideology or principle in 89% of the cases. I think they follow whichever party they're from. So, uh, Given that the Republican Party seems to be on both sides of this issue, do we have any idea how the conservative Supreme Court would rule? It's just very hard to say. Um, you know, a lot of these cases end up being on a 5-4 vote, and it is, you know, they are looking at constitutional issues at the heart of the Constitution. And let me give you an example of why this is so difficult to predict. The Congressional Research Service, which is a nonpartisan, very respected body, relied on by both parties, they looked at this question, and what they concluded, I'll just quote from this because I thought it was striking, it's in my story, that um, determining whether this mandate is constitutional, quote, is the, perhaps the most challenging question posed by such a proposal as it is a novel issue whether Congress may use this clause to require an individual to purchase a good or a service. So the Congressional Research Service itself is saying it's just too close to call. Um, so certainly it's too close to call for me. I hear you on that, and it's interesting because I know the right, and we're talking to Michael Cranish. He wrote this for the Boston Globe. Uh, he's got a new book out, too, Flight from Monticello, Thomas Jefferson at War, uh, on a wholly separate issue, but an totally interesting separate. issue. Um, well, it goes back to some revolutionary you know, founding father issues and so forth, so it's interesting the two things do sort of cross over in a, in a very small way. It, 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 they do because we're, in essence, trying to read Jefferson's mind here <laughs> as to uh, what he meant by the Congress. Constitutional Close. Convention. <laughs> yes. And... Um, and, and, you know, I know, Michael, that the Republicans have been saying, oh, Obama's unconstitutional uh, from the very beginning. They use the 10th Amendment I mean, just because the 10th Amendment is vague uh, when they didn't seem to care about constitutional issues when Bush was in charge and, you know, 
as Governor Ventura said earlier in the program, uh, just absolutely ripped the Fourth Amendment apart. But I, I just I think they might be onto something here. But you know, I guess it goes to a broader issue. Can can the government have uh, if they say that we are are forced to buy life insurance? I'm sorry, health care insurance. Can they also say we're forced to buy life insurance? Can they say we're forced to buy orange juice from Tropicana? Or a new, a new GM car, for that matter. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, this is the point. I mean, when you start getting there, you look at it and say, well, what's the line? And so the opponents would say the government should not be in the business of requiring people to purchase certain things. Clearly, the federal government does require us to do a number of things, um, and it's just a question of whether this should fall into that category. You know, the history of this country really at the very beginning, you know, rested on some of these state versus federal issues. We had the Civil War. We had the Civil Rights era. A lot of questions over states' rights. And part of the way this issue is being framed in Virginia is that some people are saying it's the same issues. It's not a racial issue, obviously. But I quoted one um, delegate in the story who said, you take out the, the subject and it sounds similar, she said, to what was known as massive resistance regarding the civil rights era. The, the proponents of the legislation strenuously reject that parallel and say there's no comparison, that this is an entirely different issue. But part of it at its heart is this sort of state versus federal issue. Another matter which is interesting because I'm writing for the Boston Globe, is that in Massachusetts, uh, the health care plan that uh, then-Governor Romney put through did require people in the state to have health insurance and provided subsidies to those who couldn't afford it. As a result, we have about 98% of residents of Massachusetts who have health insurance. Rates have gone up for various reasons, and that's a whole other show, perhaps. But um, in that case, it is a state mandate. The state is telling its citizens what to do. And in this case, you have another state saying, that neither neither the state nor the federal government should have to tell the citizens of Virginia to have health insurance. And as you mentioned at the outset, a lot of other states are also looking at similar legislation. Michael, I want to ask you one more question because, look, you know, I want to separate the advocates um, from the issue itself because the guys that are pushing for it in Virginia, as you write about, I, I don't trust them at all. <laughs> and uh, do they have different motives? Well, they were against Obama before they uh, even know why. There they is, were I mean, in fairness, to... there are some Democrats who support support this. So, um, you know, just. There's some. Yes, there are. And so that's why I think the issue is an important and interesting one, even though I might not agree with the, most of the advocates of it, specifically in Virginia. Uh, but there is a counter-argument. And, for example, they say, well, look, the IRS, uh, you know, makes you do a lot of things. I mean, it has a tremendous number of mandates, if you want to put it that way. Is there validity in that argument, too? Well, some people would say, look, if you don't pay your taxes, you're going to pay a fine. So... In essence, if you don't have health insurance, you're subject to a fine. So some people use that parallel and say, see, what's the difference? Of course, the Constitution specifically says that you can tax people. Is there a specific wording that says you can require them to purchase something? Well, some people will argue over that. You know, whether you, I mean, right now when you have you know, your pay, you have to get a certain amount for Social Security, Medicare, things like that. Everything is slightly different. So if you're a lawyer arguing for the Supreme Court, you will note those differences surely, and we don't know what the Supreme Court will end up uh, saying. What we do know is that this whole matter is at the heart of Obama's plan. The president was a former constitutional law professor, and the plan does rely on this question of constitutionality. Yeah, well, I mean, he was a former constitutional law professor, but that, that hasn't helped uh, bring habeas corpus back as quickly as we would like. That hasn't helped him bring back the Fourth Amendment as quickly as we would like. So I'm not sold on his constitutional law credentials, but I guess that's a separate issue for a separate day. A separate issue. Yes. All right. Michael Cranish, writing for the Boston Globe. Thank you so much for joining us. Really appreciate it. Sure, thank you.